If you have your Bibles, um, turn with me this morning to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29 is the passage that we will be looking at. Jeremiah 29. And let me read to you verses 4 through verse 7. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. We begin a new series this morning on the topic of marriage and family. We'll spend the rest of our summer looking at this topic, and we will cover a wide gamut of things over the next several weeks. And when you start studying what the Bible teaches on this topic, you will find, like I did, that we easily get sucked into what culture teaches and the world's ideologies, and we realize that it's completely different from what God teaches. There are things that God says that aren't very popular in our culture today. So getting back to the Bible and seeing what God teaches is going to be good for all of us, whether we're single, we're married, we're divorced, we have kids, or we don't have kids. In culture, we're on the verge of disaster. We're like headed toward a cliff, and we're not slowing down. We're actually picking up steam as we're headed toward this cliff. The future of our nation and the future of our families in our nation is at stake here. Families are the building block of our society and our culture. As a child of God, as a minister, I'm interested in the gospel that's at stake in regards to marriage and family. We talk a lot about here about being on mission for the gospel in our city. But if we don't build up, establish, press forward with a high view, countercultural view of marriage and family, we can kiss our hopes of the gospel advancing goodbye. If we don't uphold marriage as a gospel witness and have a long term view of passing the gospel from generation to generation, which happens when we don't have a high view of marriage or a high view of family or a high view of kids then the gospel will eventually die. My goal during this series is to change the way you value, the way you think about marriage, the way you think about children, the way you think about families. I want to press upon you the truth of Scripture. If you're married, I want to give you hope and encouragement that your marriage can work. It's hard, I admit it. It's even harder when you're married and you have kids and you're trying to raise them in our community, in our culture. But it's possible. And it's what God is calling us to do. So this morning, we're going to look at topics from a cultural standpoint. What's the ideologies and understanding of marriage and family in our culture? And I want to begin our series by looking at a contrast. Contrast what the world teaches, what the world portrays. Contrast that to what the Bible portrays. I want to look at what culture is telling you of how things are, how they're supposed to be, and how things are going to be, and how things are supposed to function. And I want to contrast that with the truth of God's word and show you what it's supposed to be. We're going to look at a bunch of different things today. So we'll begin by looking at marriage. Marriage in our culture is practically a joke, isn't it? It's laughed at by most young people. It's regretted by most old people. It's envied by virtually no one. It's been hijacked by the homosexual community. It's been ostracized by the feminist community. It's been humiliated by the conservative community. It's become pointless with the American dream becoming the pursuit of individual fame and fortune to the neglect of any idea of commitment and legacy. One author recently wrote, he said, monogamy, which is really, more, which is really no more than a useful social convention, will not survive. It is rarely honored and practiced. Soon it will be vanished as an ideal. Marriages that do occur only last a few years at best. Many people have been divorced numerous times. Many ideas of faithfulness, commitment is not even mumbled in the homes of marriages today. In fact, you look at some European countries, 
They have marriage contracts now, like marriage licenses. Basically, you get married, and you can renew your marriage contract every five years. If you don't want to be married, at the end of five years, your contract simply expires, and you don't have to stay married anymore. Because they do this because of the high cost of divorce. Between 1960 and 2000, divorce rate has increased in our community by 100%. The number of actual marriages that take place have decreased by 41%. Cohab cohabitation, living together, not married, is up 1,000%. This is because adultery is so rampant in our society. People don't get married because they end up cheating on one another. So what's the point of getting married? One out of three men, one out of four women will cheat on their spouse during their marriage. It's not shocking when you pick up the newspaper and the headlines are all about scandals of sex scandals. A lot of them are political. John Edwards was in the news recently for he was, being, he was being indicted. He was a former vice presidential candidate, but he was caught having an affair um, while his wife had cancer. Elliot Spitzer, the former governor of New York, steps down after his name shows up on a phone list of a high-end escort service. New Jersey Governor Mark James McGreevy resigns from office after it's discovered that he had sex with a member of his cabinet, a man. South Carolina Governor Mark Stanford went missing for a week. No one knows where he is, and they find him. He was in South America having an affair with a woman that he meets at a social party. Colorado Senator Gary Hart, he dares the media to follow him and says, follow me, see if you can find anything wrong with me. They follow him, and they find a prostitute in his house. And you can add to the list President Clinton, I did not have sex with that woman. David Letterman, Alice Rodriguez, Tiger Woods, evangelical pastors like Eddie Long, Ted Haggard, the scandal that's going on in the Catholic Church with the bishops, and the list goes on and on and on. It's not shocking. This is what we have as normal idea in our life. And it's not just in real life, it's what's being displayed on television and film. Virtually every television show there is, there is some reference or character that's a mockery of marriage as we understand it in the Bible. The modern picture of marriage in television is two people who are selfish individuals, who are trying to use the other person to find happiness, only to find destruction. Not sure if you guys are fans of Everyone Loves Raymond, but every marriage in that show is about selfish people living for themselves and mentally and emotionally abusing one another. What about singleness? What about love and singleness? The percentage of people that choose to remain single is increasing year by year. Currently, almost 35% of DFW are single. The Metroplex are single folks. Love and sex has virtually become synonymous in our culture. You leave biblical love in the shadow. In place of what the Bible calls agape, commitment love, that's committed no matter what happens, you're committed no matter what goes on. This has been replaced by an Eros type of love, an emotional, erotic type of love. When you reject the idea of humanity being created in the image of God, we're headed for all types of destruction. That humanity, that the person that you're with is a child of God, is created in the image of God. Every 1.6 minutes, somewhere in America, someone is being sexually assaulted. That will be 20 or 30 by the time I'm done, depending on how long I take. The U.S. has the highest rate of rape in countries that establish such statistics. Four times higher than Germany, 20 times higher than Japan. They did a survey of teenage boys and girls, and they came up with the following stats. 56% of girls, 76% believe that the forced sex is acceptable. It's not shocking when stats say that one in four girls and one in four boys have been sexually assaulted before the age of 18. And as a result of this skewed view of love and sex, this leads a lot of singles not to ever consider marriage. When you understand what the value of our culture is saying about marriage and you understand what about sex and love and singles, why? Why get married? Why do you even want to get, enter into marriage? And as a result, the idea of preparing for marriage, longing for marriage, desiring marriage is not even on most young people's radar. In 1970, 25% of 25 year olds were single. One out of four were single that were 25. 
Today, that number is now 68% of 25-year-olds. The average age for people that get married is 26 for women, 28 for men. It's a five-year increase since 1970. Instead of enjoying the good life that the scripture speaks of, many people are practicing the hookup, shack up, break up game of death, birth controls as their savior, keeping them from the hell of marriage, children, and obligation. If that fails, a board of murder often suffices. People love sex, but they don't love marriage. They love sex, but they don't love children. And the reason is, is because they don't love God. And they've separated children, marriage, and family, and sex into issues that somehow are not related at all anymore. What about men? We looked at marriages. We looked at singleness. What about men? Husbands, fathers, men. Men, for the most part, are just boys in our culture today, aren't they? They're called, they call it the Peter Pan syndrome. They perpetual boyhood that keeps living on and on. You never grow up. You live for adventure, refusing to grow up, live for intrigue, live for sex. And this is demonstrated in most comedies that are shown. As for husbands, they are far and few in between. If they do exist, they are on the verge of leaving it, content to beat their wives into submission, or content to wear the skirt in the family and not be a man at all. As for fathers, they're content with helping making babies, but they're not there to raise the child, not having responsibility for them when they're born. The dads that are around are pretty much absent because of their obsession with work, with their jobs, with their hobbies, with their money, or they're in prison. In an article that was written recently called Wimps and Barbarians, the author gives a glimpse into the modern day boyhood culture that we live in. And he divides men into two groups, wimps and barbarians. The barbarians are crude, antisocial, uncivilized characters. The other group is the wimps, whiny, incapable of making any decisions. Barbarians don't use words, or don't need words or use them. They communicate with each other using grunts, shrugs, or various noises. When barbarians actually use words, their speech is usually laced with profanity. At the other end are the wimps, lacking all manly conviction and character. Robbed of ambition, wimps make worthless watchdogs. He's incapable of Living up to his responsibilities as a man, he shows no valor in his public or private life. He seems to have no fight in him. He's looking for the easiest way out of a problem. With respect to women, barbarians demonstrate a crudeness, profanity, and violence that treat women as objects for the man's pleasure. Barbarians show women no respect and are completely lacking in the virtue of affection and respect for the well-being of women. Wimps, on the other hand, look to women for emotional support. They see women as conversation partners and they look to women for pity. They're shameless. And we see this in our culture today. What about women? Wives, mothers, women. Women have brought into the lie that they need to find joy and happiness in their power and freedom or in their power to seduce men. This leads to things like reprodu reproductive freedom, which is basically a nice word for abortion. It's estimated that in our state alone, last year in our conservative state of Texas, 80,000 abortions happened in the year 2011. It also leads to things like anorexia, bulimia, based on image, something that seven million women suffer with. One out of 200 women suffer from anorexia. anorexia. Six out of 200 women suffer from bulimia. The mortality rate associated with anorexia is 12 times higher than all of the other causes of death for women between the ages of 15 and 24. What about wives? They're either wic victims of a physical or emotional abuse of selfish men, or they rule over their husbands and make a joke of them all the time. TV and film have everything from mindless Stafford wives, where they just submit to whatever the husband tells them, or we have the popular TV sitcoms where a husband is basically an idiot, and the wife trash talks him in front of everyone, especially the kids. Everyone loves Raymond where we have the adultery-filled gossip shows like Desperate Housewives. What about mothers? Mothers, for the most part, are seen as second-class citizens who bound themselves to the misery of raising snotty-nosed brats that they're looked down upon for that. Other women like to see kids and maybe speak of them from a distance, but still feel bad for the poor mom that has to raise these kids and have to go home with them. I had a conversation recently with a woman that works in a children's ministry 
And she says, I love working with kids, but I'm so grateful I don't have any kids of my own. She works in children's ministry. This leads to the wanting of escape from real life. They want to get the real life outside of marriage, outside of motherhood, outside, and they find their identity somewhere else. This leads to Newsweek coming out with an article a few years ago entitled, I'm a better mom since I left my child. Overall, feminism is the name of the game today. The fight to make women just like man as, to make women just like man as possible. But in many ways, this has led to a greater demise and degradation of women in our culture. But people like Patty Kelly, she's a professor at the, uh, and an anthropologist at George Washington University. She doesn't think so. She recently went to Mexico and studied the brothels and prostitution there and came back with the argument that we should legalize prostitution in our country for the following reasons. She gives five reasons. One, you get to set your own hours. Two, you get to set your own rates. Three, you get to determine what you will do and what you'll not do. Four, you get happiness. Five, you get the boyfriend in the process. This is coming from a professor at George Washington University. She goes on to say, to say that all sex workers are victims and all clients are demons is the easy way out. Perhaps it's time to face the issue and face the facts like adults with a little less moralizing and a good deal more honesty. So she talks about former Governor um, Spitzer in New York and she's, who was caught um, with prostitutes. He, and she says, if he had walked into the brothel, my questions would be the following. One, was he respectful? Was he safe? Did he pay well? If he did, if the answer to all three of those questions are yes, I voted for him once, I would vote for him again. Do you realize that the only industries in our community where women make more money than men is pornography and prostitution? This is what feminism has brought to our culture. What about children and parenting? Children have little value in our culture. They become more of a nuisance than they are a blessing. Our city is on a pace to have more dogs than we have children. In fact, there's such an overpopulation of dogs in our city to the point that Dallas Morning News came out with an article saying that they euthanize 29,000 dogs a year in our city. Think about it. Dogs are treated better than children in our society. If I was walking down a street with four dogs, people would cross over from the other side to come and pet my dogs. If I was walking down the street with four kids, people on my side would cross over to the other side to avoid my kids. And my kids are angels, sometimes. Um, we're on a fight. We were on a flight a few years ago. We were on an airline and this lady walks in, a middle-aged business class woman, she walks in and she sees that she's sitting next to a mom and a three-year-old, um, I can't remember if it was a child, a daughter or son, but she sees that and she immediately declares, there is no way I'm sitting on a three-hour flight next to that thing. That's what she said, publicly, loud enough for the entire cabin to hear. The number of kids are on decline in our culture. Research now suggests that the U.S. population is growing at a faster pace than the U.S. households. There are more people, less families. Married couples with children now account for just one out of every five U.S. households. That's less than half of what it was in, 20, in 1970. These households declined in number because in the 2000s and in this decade, more people choose not to get married and more single moms choose not to find a spouse. And that rate has grown for one out of every three households now are singles or single parents. Children get the short end of the stick here, especially because of the lack of men that are stepping up to take responsibility. This leads to 40% of children that are born today are born without a dad in the picture. From 1960 to 2000, the percentage of out of wedlock births have increased from 5% in 1960 to 33% in 2010. Only 45% of teenagers today live with both of their biological parents. Thus women are left to survive with no husband, no male authority figure in their home. Meanwhile, the men are living with their parents, playing video games, and doing nothing but impregnating women moving on to the next one. For example, all of you are familiar with the nutcase Dennis Rodman that used to play in the NBA. His biological father is known to have fathered anywhere between 30 and 45 children in his lifetime. 
Dennis Rodman, in his autobiography, wrote, I haven't seen my father in over 30 years. So what's there to miss about him? I just look at it this way. Some man brought me into this world. Doesn't mean I have a father. We need godly men to be the men that God has called them to be. Moms that do keep their kids are trying to figure out what in the world they're doing. A mother in Arkansas recently was sued by her son, and the son wins the case because basically the mom had enough of her son that she hacks into his Facebook account, password, and then basically just starts blasting his son on his Facebook account. One of the things that she wrote was, of the only mistake that ever, I ever made in my life was having this kid. That's what she said about her son on his Facebook account for all of his friends and family to see. Meanwhile, the only two groups of people in our culture that are raising kids properly and having more kids in our community are the Mormons and the Muslims. In a few decades, we will be overtaken because God-fearing folks are pursuing the American dream instead of the biblical mandate of being fruitful and multiply while Muslims and Mormons will pretty much dominate our culture. Don't be shocked if that happens. All right, so that's the bad news. It's not pretty, is it? What I just presented to you is the current state of topics, current state of these topics in our culture. It's messed up, broken, all over the place. So what do I hope to get out of this series over the next several weeks? Here's my vision of what I hope to see from this series overall throughout the next few years decades and multiple generations. I envision a dynamic community of believers that passionately love Jesus. I envision singles who pour out their lives in service to Jesus and his mission, who have a heart for marriage, a heart for families, a heart for children. Singles who will reach out to care and support marriages that do exist, families that do exist, children that do exist. If God calls them to be single for the rest of their life, which God might call some of you to do, I pray that you will live your life passionately for Jesus and look for opportunities to do things that only singles could do, to go places where only singles could go, that we as family folks, married folks with children, are limited to do. I pray that you would be passionate about Jesus. I pray you young married folks in our community would thrive in your relationships, planning, envisioning for children, either your own or adopting. I envision young families where dads would lead and love their wives and their kids, where moms lovingly submit to his leadership because he's kind and gracious like Jesus, where kids feel safe and protected because mom and dad love one another. I envision families where kids long to be husbands and men and moms and wives because their parents are inspiring role models and they want to be like their parents when they grow up. And I envision to see that happen in the context of our city, of our community. I know that goes against culture today where our city is catered for single, young, urban people that are enjoying the single life, living for success and wealth. And I long to see this happen in the context of an environment that does not know Jesus and does not value marriage and does not value family. This is why I read the passage from Jeremiah 29 at the beginning. The passage is a call from God to get married, have kids, and live in the environment, in the culture where God has placed them. It was a pagan culture, but God says, go have kids, get married, and multiply. Be my people in a pagan community. So over the next several weeks, I will preach the gospel. I will teach the Bible. I will call you men to love women, to love children. I will call you to be live godly and responsible lives, to leave your childish behind you before you ruin your life and the life of people around you. I will call you to purity and call you to think not just about yourself and you, not just as a husband, not just as a father, but I'll call you to think about leaving a legacy. Think about being a grandfather one day, not just living for your needs and wants, but living your life in such a way that your children will follow your example and they would have children that love Jesus. Think about leaving a legacy. I will call you ladies. I will preach the gospel to you. I will teach you the Bible. I will call you to honor Jesus and see Jesus as the greatest treasure, as the greatest man. I will call you to pray for your marriage and to pray for your family. I will call you to live a life of purity. 
I will call you to have a passion that you honor Jesus in all of your choices and you love your brothers around here and it's shown in the choices that you make in how you dress and how you behave and how you respond. You single ladies, I will call you to be intentional of trying to attract men by your character more than how, you're, how you look. I will call you wives to submit to your husbands as Jesus submits to the Father, to support, encourage, and pray for your husbands that they will be the men that God has called them to be. I will call you guys to love your children and teach them about Jesus, to train and discipline them when necessary. I will call all of you to do this for the sake of the gospel in this city, because this is God's call for his people back when they were in exile, and this is God's call for his people here as pilgrims waiting for our heavenly home. Let me wind down by pointing a few quick things from the passage that we looked at. This is a theme passage that we will constantly look at during this series. This is a call of God to his people. If you remember the story, the people of Israel had been taken captive by the people of Babylon. It was their thought partially correct that they were being disciplined and corrected and punished for their disobedience to God. And they had, they had brought this consequence upon themselves. They were carried captive and, and taken to Babylon. But when they were taken captive and they were brought into the land, they isolated themselves and stayed away from the rest of the city. They stayed away from the rest of the community. And to them, God says, verse 4, to the exiles to whom I have sent you in, from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may be your sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. A couple of things I want to point out. Number one, the idea of missions in this passage. You have to realize that you are sent. The people of Israel thought that they were in Babylon by chance and God says, no, I sent you there. I put you there. God sent you into this environment. Why are you in Dallas and not somewhere else? Why? God sent you here. Whether you are single, whether you are married, whether you have kids, whether you don't have kids, whatever your situation is, it is because of God that you are where you are. We as Christians are to see our city as something to love and something to win for the sake of the gospel. Why am I passionate about this? Because this is where the world is moving to. The world is moving into urban settings. This week we were at the fireworks at Fair Park. And I was observing the people around us. In just a span of a few moments, I spotted people from every part of the globe, Amen. all represented in our city. God's call is for us to be part of our city, to influence our city. And as we do, we influence people from every part of the world. We're called to live our lives on mission. Secondly, the idea of moving. During the exile, there were false prophets that had come to people and were falsely prophesying that God was going to deliver them from exile in just a few years. So hang out, hide from the rest of the world. Don't get involved in community. Don't get involved in the world. Stay away, stay holy because you're gonna eventually leave. So don't do anything. This city is not your home. Don't get caught up in what's happening here. Don't care for this city. God's gonna come soon and deliver. And you hear a lot of false prophets doing that today in our community. Jesus is coming back anytime soon. Don't get involved in the city. Don't get involved in the world. Stay away. Stay isolated. Don't, don't influence the world. Live in your little bubble. And that's not what God's calling us to do. He says, influence the city. Touch the city. Let the world see what I'm like through your lives. Let the world see what a godly marriage looks like. Let the world see what living in purity looks like. Let the world see what raising godly children looks like. Don't hide from them. Be among them and influence them for my glory. See, if you think about it, there's a lot of reasons not to do this, right? It's risky to live in a city that's, that doesn't love Jesus. It's risky to send your kids to public schools where kids have different worldviews. It's risky to work with people that don't want to honor Jesus with their lives, and you do want to honor Jesus with your life. It's expensive. It's broken. It's dangerous. It's full of self-seeking, pleasure-seeking, me-first people. It's evil. But God says, I don't want you to be isolated. I want you to go and move in there, as broken and oppressive as it was. 
Surely we have the same idea and mindset as believers. How do we get to know the people? To move in, build houses, live in them, make produce. Basically, be in culture. Be among them. Families have to be involved in culture, to be at events, in marketplaces, in sports leagues, taking your kids involved to do events, in the kids' activities, to be out with your wives and your children, to be a witness and a testimony in the environment in a broken society. How do you do that? The third thing you notice here is the call to marriage. That's the heart of the text. Get married and leave a legacy. Look at the text. He's talking not just to them, but he's talking to three generations here. Move in, get a wife, have sons, and let your sons have wives. Let your kids have kids. God's vision for them was not just go get married and be successful. His vision was for generations ahead, was thinking way down the line. How do I touch my children where they touch their children and they influence their generation? God's vision was not just about them. God's call is for us to imagine not just raising good kids, not just surviving, not just being successful, but God's call for us is to imagine being a godly grandfather, proud of your children because they're raising their children in a manner that loves Jesus. It says, don't just think about your here and now, but think generations down. How do you live your life now that impacts the next generation and the generation after? Some of you are just thinking short term. If I can just get married, that'd be good. Amen, totally agree. But it's bigger than that. God's vision is not just for the here and now. It's about a legacy that goes from generations from now. Basically, think about the time you're going to die and then live backwards. Go from there. He tells them, get married and multiply. He even commands them, do not decrease. Why? Because the people of God that are in love with him should be the best possible citizens in the city where God places them. God gives a strong command there, not just to live in the city and pursue a career, but to pursue marriage, pursue family that reflects to a broken world what God is like. So many of us only think about our career, only about our future, our jobs, our security. How am I going to make it? And that's good. We need to be thinking about those things. But let me challenge you. Don't stop thinking there. Think bigger. How is God calling me to leave a legacy that goes well beyond me? Think about marriage. Think about raising children that impact the city and make you proud. Think about them choosing godly spouses and bringing godly grandchildren, grandchildren into the world and they're in love with Jesus. This is God's plan for most of you on how you make a difference in the world that God has placed you at. More than anything else, we can, more than anything else we can fix in our society, there's a lot that we can try to fix. We can try to fix our education system. We can fix our health care. We can try to fix anything else. More than any of that, we need godly families who will work at raising godly children who will also raise godly children, who love Jesus and want to honor Jesus. If that happens, society will be transformed. Number four, the call to men. He calls us to serve and pray for this city as families, to seek the welfare and the peace of the city. Basically, the city's like this old garment that's been shredded, ripped apart. It's been put through a paper shredder. That's what it looks like. It's not a garment anymore. It's completely torn, completely broken. God says, I want you to go in, get married, have kids, and I want you to grow in that city and use your family as a thread to go in and mend the brokenness of the city. Serve as a community. Serve as a family. Their witness was not just to be individual, but as a community, as a people. He tells them that you're from Jerusalem, which is the city of peace, Jerusalem, Shalom, the peaceful city. And now you've been placed in Babylon, the city of man, of passion, of pleasure, of lust. There's going to be a clash that takes place. It did take, it did take place, and it will take place today. We're called to be representatives of Jesus in a world that doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. It's not going to be pretty at first. Culture is going to collide. You're not going to be able to do the things that culture tells you to do. But this is what the Bible mandates. We see this in the teachings of Jesus, don't we? Overcome evil with good. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. We must seek to be the represent representation of what God's kingdom, God's plan, God's work is supposed to be, supposed to look like in our city. We're to pray for our city. 
We're supposed to live in it. We're supposed to grow in it. We're supposed to serve it. We're supposed to work for the common good as families, as individuals, as a community, as a church. Let me close. These are not easy things. These are challenging things, especially when you see marriages falling apart left and right and you wonder, can I make it? God doesn't call you to do something which he also does not equip you for. Everything that you need for your marriage to survive, he's given it to you. Everything that you need to make your, to raise your children, the wisdom, the knowledge, the intellect, he's given it to you. It seems impossible, but by his grace, we can do it. Our hope is not found in each other, but our hope is found in Jesus, who went down to a city. He left a marvelous city, a beautiful city, and he went to a city that was broken, and he lost everything that he had. He lost the only eternal relationship that there ever was. And when on the cross he cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He lost the city that he had. He lost all of that so that we can become citizens of a city that's to come, to be brought into the family of God and be made salt and light in the city that is. One day we will get to enjoy a city that's perfect, but today we're called to be salt and light in the city that's not. Our citizenship in the city to come and our relationship now in the family of God by his grace equips us for the city that is to stand firm here in our marriages, in our families, in our singleness, and to glorify him and to make much of him. These are hard things, but he enables us to do it. This morning as we come to the table, we recognize that it's not by our power, our might, that we're able to stand. But because Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, it enabled God to restore relationship with us. And because he died, and because he went back to heaven, he said, I'll send you the comforter. I'll send you my spirit. And my spirit will now live inside of you. And he will guide you. He will empower you. He will enable you to live a life that brings glory to me. He doesn't leave you on your own to do this but he gives you his spirit so that you can have marriages that honor God. You singles, you can live in purity in a way that honor God. You families, you can raise your children in a way that honor God. So as we come to the table this morning, we recognize that God, if it wasn't for your help, we would be destroyed. We'd be failures. We would have ruined our lives. But we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We thank you for saving us, filling us with your spirit, enabling us to live our lives for your glory. As we go into the table, would you meditate on the words that were spoken? Would you examine your hearts? If your worldview to marriage, to children, to family, to singleness, is anything contrary to what the Bible teaches, this morning I challenge you, would you repent? And would you come to the table and partake of the elements, recognizing the power of Jesus that's working in your life. Father, as we meditate on this word, would you challenge us? If there's areas that we need to repent, would you help us to repent? Would you transform us? May we be families that honor Jesus. May we have marriages that honor Jesus. May we raise children that honor Jesus. May our singles honor Jesus in the choices that they make. May those of us who, in this room, who have screwed up, may this morning as we come to the table, may we see your grace overflowing in our lives. That our past doesn't define us, our mistakes don't define us, but that we are called your sons, your daughters, and that you could redeem our sins, you could redeem our failures, you could redeem everything that we've messed up and you can use it for your glory. Thank you for Jesus. We love you. As you meditate, whenever you feel led, come and grab the elements and then we'll partake together.